uh, to be here today and um, uh, share with you uh, my thoughts on uh, what's going to happen here with solid state storage. Now, the, by the way, this presentation has not been yet uploaded to the SNA website and it will be uploaded, I promise. We just ran out of time and I didn't do quite the right formatting to, to put on the SNA logo. But uh, it was originally titled uh, The Role of um, Solid State SSD Technology in the Storage Hierarchy. Uh, I actually changed the title to uh, talk about a little revolution brewing here because I think when we will look back on uh, 2008 in a few years, uh, from a storage perspective, uh, we'll probably remember this year as the year when uh, solid state storage was uh, really came into being as being recognized uh, as a technology that will have a tremendous impact on uh, server and, and storage systems. Um, and um, of course, no, no discussion of uh, any revolution can uh, begin without providing some context. So I want to start with the history of, uh, of the hard disk. And um, there's, of course, many, many uh, milestones and, and events um, in, in that uh, history. And of course, the history is an entity. There's a lot, lot of future ahead here. And uh, one can't even talk about hard disk without mentioning the fact that uh, IBM not only invented the hard disk back in 1955, launched the first uh, commercial hard disk product in 1956, but the many, many contributions IBM has made over the uh, following years to advancing hard disk technology. Uh, I think many of you will remember the 3300 series of DAS uh, drives that was introduced in the early 70s, the uh, model 3380, and uh, I think it was launched in 1980, but I think there was a little delay getting it uh, out to market. Um, and uh, there's many other um, uh, milestones here. For example, uh, I didn't talk about uh, vendors like Seagate and uh, Connors that uh, invented new form factors. Uh, the first five and a quarter disc, I think, came out in the late uh, 70s. The first three and a half inch disc in the late 80s, two and a half additional in the 90s. And then the ongoing uh, improvements in, in density, um, bit density, uh, RPM, uh, performance, reliability. Um, so it is, it is a history that uh, the hard disk industry can be very proud of. Uh, and uh, again, it, it has defied anybody's projections from a few years ago that there was going to be a ceiling here where you know, we just couldn't push these uh, bits any denser. And you know, we have one terabyte disks in a three and a half inch form factor shipping this calendar year, two terabyte disks expected next calendar year, four terabit disks in 2010, I mean, you name it, it's just unbelievable. In fact, it has exceeded my own expectations of how many bits one can cram on this sort of magnetic uh, recording technology, uh, and uh, clearly there's no end in sight. So, uh, the, I call it the history, but this, you know, uh, this, uh, we will see hard disk for the next, I don't know how many, uh, 50 years. There was the 50th anniversary, was 2006. Uh, and I have a few uh, pictures here for your entertainment. This was the first uh, RAM deck uh, disc in 1956. It filled <laughs> the cargo bay of a, a Pan American Air Airways uh, airplane here. Um, interesting enough, you know, the first, uh, th this was a five megabyte capacity disc. <laughs> uh, this was the, uh, the uh, 3380, I believe, uh, engine from IBM, which is, you know, you may remember these very nice looking um, high-tech things. This is a contemporary uh, three and a half inch disc. Uh, I guess I got this from the Seagate website, but they all more look the same. Um, so, and, and of course, the most important thing is that the cost per gigabyte has just plummeted. Um, I, it's, it seems to be heading for zero, but it's obviously a logarithmic scale here. So um, it, is, it is just astonishing, you know, how cost-effective hard disk storage is. Um, and, you know, performance uh, is, has been kind of uh, flat based on the RPM of the disks. There have been a little improvements with the two and a half inch form factor because the, the arms didn't have to move quite as far, but uh, more or less, and I mean, these are not scientific numbers, it depends on the controller and the, the cache and so on. But, um, you know, we have about 125 IO ops for the uh, high capacity SATA type disks and maybe 200 to 300 IO ops for the highest performance uh, 15K RPM disks. So this is, you know, where we have been now as an industry for uh, many years. And um, again, if you look just back at the last 10 years, uh, you know, incredible improvements in density, averaging 60% a year, which is actually faster than was predicted uh, in the early 90s. Uh, cost per gigabyte tracking those kind of density improvements. Uh, 
uh, significant improvements in transfer rate because of the, the bit density being higher, uh, the new interfaces, SAS, SATA, 1.0, 2.0, 3.0. Uh, unfortunately, no significant improvements in IO ops, uh, more or less the same, and um, really not much reliability improvement on a per disk uh, basis. Um, but um, there's no question, you know, this has been a, a driving force for the whole storage industry and people buying, putting in more and more storage each year. Uh, I guess one thing I forgot to mention here is that the IOPS per gigabyte is actually going down, right? So as the capacity is increasing, the IOPS per store, information stored is declining. Uh, unfortunately, meanwhile, the server performance has been also increasing at a rate of, say, 50 or 60% a year leading to this famous I.O. gap, you know, the server performance is going like this, the I.O. performance is constant, you know, what do we do? And um, this is a problem that uh, uh, is now going to be addressed with this beautiful new technology that has a completely different beginning. So let's look at the history of Flash here for a second. So as far as I can tell, the first uh, company that invented Flash was actually Toshiba in 1985. And they showed a chip at the uh, some uh, s uh, chip conference. So this was not a product yet, but sort of the first flash chip. Now they had um, a smaller type of erasable uh, EEPROMs earlier than that, but they were so small that uh, you know one couldn't really call them a sort of a, a storage device in, in the sense of a storage device. Uh, first multi-level flash was invented in 1995. Had a capacity of 32 megabits. Um, and then, you know, the performance, uh, I rather the density numbers just uh, climbed incredibly. In 2002, Samsung shipped the first gigabit chips in 120 nanometer technology. Three years later, four gigabit chips in 70 nanometers. And another three years later, uh, there's now a 16 gigabit chip uh, in 56 nanometer technology. This is a single device. Those are stacked them, of course, multiple die per chip. Um, market is somewhere between 15 or more billion dollars in revenue. Very, very interesting, quick uh, evolution here. Uh, in case you wonder how small these flash chips are, uh, this is a, I think the scale on the bottom are millimeters and uh, this would be, oops, uh, 10 millimeters from here to here. So it's basically, uh, you know, the package is about a little more than half an inch long and sort of a, you know, a quarter of an inch wide. This is the 16 gigabit flash package. So it's actually denser than a, disk of all things. Uh, it's just incredible how, how small these chips are. Um, but what's even more incredible is how cheap these things have become. And uh, if you, I know it's a little hard to read from the back and I, I copied this slide from our friends at uh, Gartner. It's the recent uh, August uh, forecast. And uh, if you pay attention to this lowest uh, line here where they say ASP change, this is at the device level of course, but Basically, each year the price per flash per gigabyte or per bit declined roughly 50% uh, this year, an astonishing over 60%. And the year isn't over yet, and you know they expect to that to level out. But let's just say in the average, um, you know the price has been going down 50% a year, uh, and that is of course astonishing in the sense that back in 2004, just four years ago, a gigabyte of flash cost over $100. We're talking device level here, not not system level. Uh, this year, the same capacity would cost a mere $3, and in as few as four years from now, it's a projected to cost for 25 cents. So, you know, here we're going from over $100 to uh, 25 cents in eight years, and, you know, this is sort of the law of exponential uh, growth curves, or in this case, exponential declines of cost, which is truly nothing short of amazing of what that really means for the industry. And I think you can do the math that, you know, flash at either this year's cost level or beyond is getting a very, very attractive proposition uh, for what it does. Now, it's not so easy for the flash manufacturers, I should add. So they're, uh, they're of course, shipping, you know, twice as much, three times as much each year in terms of gigabyte. But in terms of the actual revenue, um, it seems to be flattening out because, of course, you have to, when the price goes down by half, you have to ship twice as much just to stay in place. And um, I should add to that that these uh, flash factories um, are incredibly expensive um, to build. Uh, I used to think they cost um, sort of a billion dollars to build a state-of-the-art uh, semiconductor fact factory that makes flash. I recently read uh, that the capital investment, you know, just this year was over $10 billion in, you know, multiple factories. And this has been going on year after year after year. So the industry is investing a good percentage of the revenue in more factories to crank out more, more chips under the thesis that if you can't deliver more product, you know, you're not going to be a market leader and you're not going to get the same economics. So there's an incredible um, uh, 
increasing capacity coming online to make these components and um, under the assumption of course that there's a market that will absorb them at the right price point. So again, this is, uh, this is where we're today, incredible decline just this year, and obviously this makes Flash uh, very interesting. I should add, and I forgot to, to say it earlier, this is for so-called multi-level Flash. Multi-level Flash means each transistor stores more than uh, a bit, uh, typically two or three bits, uh, in the future maybe up to four bits. Uh, the single level flash, which has other uh, advantages in particular, you can write it uh, a lot better than the uh, multi-level flash, is proportionally more expensive. So a single level flash uh, this year uh, would be three to four times higher than these numbers here, which is the, the price for the multi-level flash. Um, and again, this, is, uh, this highlights this. So part of the cost erosion here has been that the industry is managing to get more and more bits per transistor. Um, and, um, you know, so MLC, it doesn't actually say how many bits they are, but uh, the industry is now looking to get from three to four bits per, per cell or per transistor, which is, again, nothing short of miraculous, uh, but that explains the rapid uh, increase in density as well as the price erosion. Um, now, um, so uh, going back to these technologies, there is a, there is a mild problem with multi-level flash, which of course is the, the multi-level flash is what you get in your iPod or in your iPhone and the cameras, uh, and none of these devices write a lot. I mean, you take a picture, you take a thousand pictures, you take 10,000 pictures, but uh, at the end of the day, it's not written continuously. Uh, and uh, this wouldn't quite work for enterprise storage, where at least uh, most of the time there's a lot of writing going on. So single level flash, which is one bit per transistor, is a much more robust technology. Um, it has been recently demonstrated to sustain over 500,000 write cycles per sector, and of course there's many, many sectors per device, uh, and uh, the vendors now think they, can, they will be able to push this to well over a million. So the difference between single level and multi-level flash today is a factor of 50 regarding to write robustness, and it could be a factor of 100 or more going forward, and this is of course a big, big difference. Um, now to express this in different terms, uh, with single level flash and a suitable controller that does so-called VR leveling where you know, it remaps all the blocks on a continuous basis so that all the blocks get written equally, you can actually write continuously to this device and it will not fail for five years roughly. So that's kind of a good number for enterprise because in five years from now, most likely the current capacitors are completely obsolete and you're going to just throw out these devices and put in something new. Whereas a multi-level flash chip under the same conditions wouldn't last even a few months. Okay, so uh, unless, you know, there are some, uh, there may be some read mostly applications in enterprise, but uh, at least I don't know too many of these. Uh, but uh, again, most, uh, when, when people talk about SSDs, they really mean single level uh, technology, which, uh, uh, which lasts a lot longer. And the failure mode, uh, I should also tell you, it's not, not that the whole device fails, but certain blocks will fail. So basically the, there's some threshold shifts in the transistors or some electron gets trapped in these uh, oxide layers and as a result they can't read or write these bits anymore and then that block will simply get mapped out just like in the disk drive uh, and uh, eventually the capacity of the device sort of shrinks you know one block at a time. Um, now uh, let's talk about performance. So uh, flash looks really good. Uh, access times are 100 microseconds or below. There's actually a uh, believe now that it could be pushed significantly lower into in the future for single level flash. Again, this is sort of a cost uh, trade-off, but by the really uh, designing for uh, even shorter access time, it, it may be possible to push it down into the tens of microsecond range. But the device is available today in the 100 microsecond range, which is roughly 10,000 uh, IOPS. Remember, this is just one, one chip here. And um, the devices, of course, are um, controlled by a controller called the flash memory controller. Today's controllers have typically four channels, so a flash memory controller with four of these devices will actually do uh, theoretically up to 40K IOPS. We've measured up to 30K IOPS in, in lab tests, which again is nothing short of miraculous, about the equivalent of 100 15K RPM disks or 200, you know, uh, 70 to 100 RPM disks. Write cycles are quite a bit slower, um, and there's two things going on. Is first, the write has to be read modified, read verified that once you write it, it's actually in the chip. But number two, um, it, what's really slow is actually the erase cycle. So erasing takes by far the longest on the device. Now, <coughs> you normally don't see that because the erase cycles are going to be hidden, sort of erase ahead before you write into an empty part of the the array. And uh, in addition, <coughs> the, the controller chips all do white buffering, so the writes actually first go into DRAM before they even get put into the device. 
so the way it appears to the system is that the writes are uh, at the controller level here in the 10,000 IOPS range or on a per channel basis would be about 2,500 IOPS. So it's quite a bit slower than the reads, but still far, far faster than a conventional disk drive. Uh, in this case, about 30 times faster than the highest speed 15K um, RPM disk and again up to 100 times faster than a, a slower disk. Now, um, there is also no recognition uh, in the supplier base that this so-called uh, enterprise flash, a flash that's optimized for enterprise storage applications is a potentially important new market segment. Uh, so there's new design efforts to improve the reliability, the throughput, uh, you know, going to higher clock rates on the actual interface, reducing the access time. There's as much if not more, more work going on on the actual flash controllers. Um, you know, they all are looking at fast I.O. interfaces, next generation uh, SAS, SATA channels, more flash channels, faster on-chip of CPUs, uh, more, more caching. So this, uh, we're just at the beginning stages of really optimizing essentially for uh, this function. And um, uh, it's actually important to recognize how important this little flash memory controller is for the overall reliability uh, and the performance of the SSD as seen by the system. Because this FMC, of course, the flash memory controller, has to do all the error checking, error correction, wear leveling, bad block mapping, scrubbing, write caching, read caching, whatever is going on is happening in that controller. And uh, again, uh, there's a, a number of companies designing such controllers uh, at last count, so a dozen companies now uh, working on controller designs. Uh, and uh, clearly, there's going to be significant performance improvements ahead uh, just on the controller level. Uh, what a typical controller looks like is it has a, either a SATA or in the future perhaps a SAS interface uh, on one side. Uh, there's DRAM to do the, the write buffering uh, before the writes have written to the flash. There's you know typically four or more flash channels, uh, each supporting multiple flash chips. And then there's uh, local you know microcode storage, some cases on chip, some cases off chip. There's actually a lot of code in these controllers and uh, now we, can, we already have been doing a lot of upgrading in our own labs uh, of the latest microcode versions, but uh, there's ongoing development on that front. So that's uh, what the actual FMC or flash memory controller does. But going back to sort of the top level view, so at the controller level where the controller is what's in an SSD, you understand the SSD is a controller plus multiple uh, flash channels. Flash is roughly 100 or you know more than 100 times faster than conventional hard disks consumes less power than a hard disk, more reliable than a hard disk, physically smaller, only issues cost. So on the cost front, uh, disks are a lot cheaper on a per gigabit basis. However, flash is a lot cheaper on a IOPS basis. So if you measure dollars per IOPS, flash wins hands down. On a gigabyte per basis, disk wins hands down. So um, uh, what do we do about that? Well, the best thing, of course, is to combine uh, flash and disk in the, at the system level into one system and essentially use the flash as the cache to the disk. And um, uh, that's in recognition that most data that's actually stored out there is not actively being accessed. I mean, it couldn't be. There's just not enough IO ops. So the working set of any database or any, any kind of storage application is typically a few percent of the total stored capacity. And you know this is just crying out loud to saying let's cache that working set in in a flash, which is of course re reliable, meaning stable storage, and let's try to make the whole disk subsystem or the disk array appear as fast as a flash by doing this kind of caching. Um, we have done uh, quite a bit of uh, lab tests and and uh, measurements uh, along those lines, and uh, I think we have reported on, on previous occasions in public that we have seen uh, performance gains, you know, even with a very small number of, of solid state disks, uh, that front-ended larger number of uh, conventional hard disks uh, between a factor of 10 and 20 uh, without making any change whatsoever to the actual application. Uh, now, obviously, this is for I.O. intensive workloads, but it just proves the point that caches do work and, uh, and SSD uh, can be inserted into this kind of hierarchy without having to change the application and will provide an immediate uh, and very significant performance, uh, cost performance benefit. Uh, now, one of the, uh, the benefits we do have at, at Sun is the uh, Solaris CFS file system, which the way it's designed, it supports a, a, a memory cache today known as the memcache. And uh, this is what it's cached you know, in the machine itself, in the server, in the memory of the server. And um, the efficiency of that cache, of course, is limited to the size of that main memory, which is typically, say, 32 or perhaps 64, maybe 128 gigabytes. 
Now, uh, from a from a uh, architecture standpoint, uh, what we did is we extended this memcache into the flash, such that the same algorithms that were already in place to cache the uh, the files on the memcache are now applied to the flash. And of course, a flash subsystem can be designed and implemented to be much larger than the physical memory on the server. So we have looked at uh, and, and tried out flash systems in the in the terabyte range. And uh, you know we can see a very significant performance benefit of having flash that's say 10 times larger than the main memory of the server, uh, providing this sort of extended caching for the file system. Now, what we actually did is we divided this flash cache into two segments. One is for the read caching, so the information that's actually brought in uh, where uh, we can either read ahead or there's reuse of, of certain files. And this is internally known as readzilla. And then for the uh, transactional component, which is the writes, uh, which is called logzilla. Now these, uh, the reason we split this is they actually have completely different performance requirements and uh, we're still looking at whether we could implement the readzilla cache with, for example, multi-level uh, flash technology, whereas the, the logzilla case, of course, is where all the writes go, so that's definitely the single level technology. But in either event, uh, you know, we've seen uh, tremendous cost performance gains. And uh, one uh, example of that, and this is a, a small scale example I should add, is um, we took one of our you know, standard uh, two U servers with, which has eight two and a half inch uh, local disk drives and measured the performance of that system compared to the exactly the same hardware, same benchmark, but there was only six uh, uh, slower SATA uh, 4200 RPM disks and two solid state disks in the same form factor. So we just swapped out the disk and loaded in two SSDs and left six of these other disks behind except we converted them to a, a lower cost technology. And you can see here below uh, where we, in blue, we show what, the, what we call the hybrid storage pool which is the combination of SSD and SATA disk technology does compared to the, the yellow line which is the traditional um, uh, storage technology which is a 10K RPM disk in this example. So the, again, this is a trivially small scale uh, benchmark here. The um, read case, uh, three times the IOPS. Uh, the write case was a, just a little bit faster, uh, but the storage capacity was uh, 2x. Uh, and this was, I, I should have added, this is at the same cost. So in other words, the whole argument was, you're spending you know, the same dollars on this as you would be spending on this. Now, uh, we have since done, and this was done many, many months ago, um, we have since done much larger scale uh, experiments, and uh, it actually gets a lot more interesting when the capacity of the flash gets bigger. So uh, once the flash capacity gets to the uh, terabyte range, uh, what we found is that you can you know, get very significant performance improvements for 100 terabyte kind of size databases. And um, I had hoped we can talk about these results in public here, but they're not quite announced. So since this is a public talk, I, I can only tell you that the performance looks great. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so uh, the, the, the code name for this project uh, internally is Mongo, uh, and don't ask me what that stands for. Uh, but um, the basic question we ask ourselves is, uh, you know, what's really the speed limit with Flash? You know, can we really sort of get through a million or more multi-million IOPS uh, barrier? And what do we have to do at the level of a storage fabric to support these kind of performance numbers? And of course, how much space, power, and cooling will this all take? Um, so uh, again, what, what I can share with you, what we have found so far is that the speed limit was actually not the flash, but believe it or not, the HCAs. So it turns out the HCAs were just never designed for these kind of high uh, IOPS data rates. The typical HCA today does you know, 150,000, you know, maybe 200,000 IOPS on a good day. And you know it's it's actually running out of I/O slots to configure enough uh, HCAs to get to millions, multi-million. So uh, I think, uh, roughly speaking, sorry, let me turn off this phone. This is oh. uh, a million I/O ops are uh, easily easily achievable. Million IOPS are, are achievable today with, um, let's just call this off the shelf, the shelf technology. Um, to get to more, uh, we'll need um, a combination of faster HDs, faster servers, more memory bandwidth, more IO slots, PCH into SAS 2.0, wh whatever it takes. But you know, we, we are not. That's obviously not shipping today. Um, 
And another thing we found is that uh, the existing uh, storage topologies, basically the way people have built storage arrays, uh, are uh, problematic, meaning useless for solid state because they're really designed for the hard disk performance, meaning you know you get 16 disks in a 3U box or maybe 24, 2 half inch in a 2U box, but that was only you know maybe a few thousand I/O ops. So uh, there's not enough I/O channels uh, to to drive the bandwidth or the uh, I/O rate that flash can support. Um, but it is also true that SSDs will provide a very large uh, space and power savings, certainly on a do dollar per IO op spaces or watt per IO op spaces compared to any hard disk. I mean, to put this in perspective, uh, to get to a million IO ops with uh, lowest cost, you know, this technology would require approximately 10,000 disk drives. I mean, average out to 100 IO ops, and um, each uh, rack has what 200, 300 disk drives. So this would be something like 30 or 40 racks and racks and racks and racks of storage to just get to million IO ops. Whereas in Flash, you know, we think we can do this in a few uh, units of uh, of packaging. So uh, it's a in incredible uh, density improvements on an IO ops basis. And again, you know, we don't we're not saying here in any way that uh, hard disks are going away and Flash will take over, but it's being able to use that sort of cache, this million IOPS cache, in front of a, a very large storage array that makes this, this very interesting. Um, now, we have looked at other use models of Flash, and, and they're all compelling, I would say, or should add in their own uh, way. Um, the first one is to just replace all these local disks with Flash. Uh, this is basically a no-brainer. It's just a question of cost. Uh, it saves power, space, uh, improves reliability. Um, uh, the one that's... Uh, a little more controversial is, you know, whether flash could be made part of the actual memory hierarchy. In other words, can memory be extended uh, to um, add flash to the DRAM? And um, there's sort of two problems here. Number one, you know, flash is not nearly as fast as DRAM. You know, at 100 microseconds, it's about a thousand times slower than DRAM, which is 100 nanoseconds or you know, 50 microseconds, 50 nanoseconds. But the the bigger problem is, it's just not application transparent, meaning you cannot add flash to memory and then expect to do a read or write cycle without uh, changing application to, to gain performance here. So there are still some people trying that, but I think that's very challenging from a, what we would call a uh, application transparency standpoint. Uh, what's more promising to me is to uh, you know replace the existing storage uh, IO protocols, meaning SCSI, SAS, uh, fiber channel with a, a memory to memory transfer mechanism. Uh, Basically, storage protocols were designed and were optimized for disk drives, obviously, and it's convenient to, to plug the flash into these existing channels, but they're basically too slow to take advantage of what the flash can do. And it seems to me that this will be required to get to multi-million uh, IO ops, which is something flash can actually support, but uh, it would be a, a very, uh, uh, maybe impossible to try to do this with a fiber channel or SAS SCSI uh, protocol set. Um, now, uh, before anybody here sort of believes that a uh, hard disk is, um, is going out of business, I, I uh, leveraged another foil from our friends at Gartner that is the most recent projection on both the, the growth and uh, in terms of uh, units and, and revenue for both hard disks here in blue and, and the NAND flash in red. And the vertical scale, which is uh, billions of dollars of revenue, uh, is actually the, the same, but the, the, the left scale is like the, the line here and the right scale is the big bar. So if you look at the uh, line here for a second, um, at least on Gartner's uh, projections, the uh, hard disk dis distance is growing at a very healthy clip in both in units and revenue for the next many years. Uh, and it's surprisingly, you know, projected to almost double, I would say, from the 2007 levels to 2012. Uh, and, and in terms of units and in terms of uh, revenue, still increase maybe another 30% or so. So there's a very healthy uh, expected growth rate. Um, I think uh, what's happening is that you know everything is getting put online and uh, every picture, every video, and um, uh, as the cost has been declining, uh, you know people uh, use storage more and more, and uh, nobody is erasing anything anymore. So it's storage basically gets consumed by all this information that's being stored. And thus, there's just this incredible growth rate of underlying demand. Now, on the flash side, the the line here is quite a bit lower. So the market has been in this what is it, 15 billion range, and and maybe it's actually flat in here. I mean, who knows? But the number of devices produced, and uh, keep in mind, that these are measured in device units, not in terms of megabytes. And the density keeps going up every every other year. 
is growing tremendously from, you know, in, in the units are kind of hard to read here, but it's like 10,000 million would be 10 billion devices <laughs> in 2012. It's just hard to imagine how many flash chips are coming out out of these factories. So uh, it, again, it doesn't say uh, this is both units. It's not, uh, the, the units are not comparable because obviously these are, you know, 100 gigabytes to terabytes, multi-terabyte disks, and these are 16, you know, 4, 8, 16 gigabits to 32 gigabit type devices. But basically both of these markets uh, are uh, high growth markets from a vendor perspective and uh, will draw very large investments, you know, on both sides to continue the development of these technologies. So, so to wrap this up, um, uh, one thing is to remember is that a flash uh, subsystem, meaning an SSD disk with uh, four channels, is about 100 times faster than a conventional hard disk, which is a great uh, improvement to any uh, performance numbers and any performance bottleneck. Uh, flash prices have been dropping almost 50% per year, year after year, and the combination of these two things makes flash uh, very interesting uh, as part of a storage hierarchy, in particular using cache, uh, flash as a cache to hard disk. Um, and uh, the promise of this is that, you know, we hope to deliver the performance of flash at the cost of a hard disk, uh, and at the same time, the hard disk will not uh, disappear uh, any time soon. So uh, that was my last slide, but I think we have a few minutes for any questions or any anything you want to ask me about this. Go ahead. Oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, so let me first talk about um, uh, just the speed of, of transitions in industry uh, in terms of changing anything. And, and those of you who have been around this industry, and I see a lot of people with gray hair, including myself, uh, you know, any, any uh, prediction that any particular interface or whatever is uh, abandoning or, or uh, ending anytime soon have always been premature and, you know, everything, in particular in storage, had had much longer life cycles than I think anybody expected. So, you know, we're just seeing a, the converting uh, of the storage interface to a SAS, SATA serial thing after that started a few years ago. Uh, fiber channel is still growing. Uh, uh, somebody actually told me that IBM is still shipping copper uh, cables, you know, the ones they did in the late 1970s, uh, even today, because some people still have that in the installed base. But the point is, you know, in the, uh, any any claims that anybody has ever made that there's the end of life of some storage interface or some something is happening instantaneously, you know, has always been been proven wrong. And and part of this is I think there's just so much infrastructure work required to change an interface, right? So just to get the HCA vendors to build faster controllers, you know, is a full architectural design cycles where the problem has to be understood, you know, uh, new ASIC or new custom chip has to be developed and by the time that goes from architecture to production, you're talking two, maybe three years. So, um, uh, so in, in this context, you know, the, the applications, meaning Oracle's database, uh, MySQL, whatever, are even harder to change because, you know, people have put all their corporate data on this beautiful database and they may be even running the last version because they don't want to upgrade to the next one yet. And, um, you know, if you touch it and something breaks, the whole company stops and so on. So there's a, a lot of concern to touch applications that are business critical and, and, and um, required to run the business. Now, um, Sun is, of course, the, the proud owner of MySQL uh, since early this year. And we have looked at uh, what it would take, you know, to really improve MySQL, just use an example here, to take advantage of Flash, you know, it's an obvious uh, question to ask. And it's actually not easy. And, and part of the problem is that there's basically too many layers in the software architecture. So um, a database like MySQL has its own transaction layers where it, it basically commits uh, uh, the uh, transactions. And then it, in our case, it runs on top, say, of Solaris CFS, which has its own transaction layers for doing that. And by the time you have, you know, multiple storage uh, software layers doing more or less similar function, but of course it's not exactly the same thing, you already lose a lot of performance. And and the, the layering has, you know, has been dated, or dates back to the fact that the I.O., meaning the disks, just were very slow. 
So nobody paid any attention to that because you know you couldn't have improved it very much. You couldn't have improved the overall performance because the underlying disk was basically too slow, right? Um, so to improve now for flash really means to attack some of these excessive or extra layers in the overall database architecture. And I shouldn't say you know rewrite the database from scratch, but taking out things that are not required or collapsing things in a way that would really accelerate performance. And this is particularly true when we talk about you know using a memory type interface instead of a, a, a conventional hard disk storage layer interface. So if there's a new abstraction to be created here as a you know API for I/O applications, um, that will take a while, let's just say, to get into the mainstream applications. But it is also what's required, of course, to really gain the performance. At the same time, it's kind of a chicken and egg problem. In other words, yes, one can build perhaps the hardware memory channel architecture to really accelerate flash to memory. But until the applications can fully take advantage of that IPN and get delivered to the market, nobody's going to buy it because you know, it can't readily use it. So backwards compatibility with existing storage uh, layers is crucial for flash technology to get inserted into the market. And then in the next few years, you know, we'll see other APIs and other collapsing of interface layers to really accelerate and to take the full advantage of what the flash technology can deliver, which really requires more a memory channel I, uh, model than the conventional disk I/O model. Now you had a second part of your question, and I'm sorry, I, no, that, 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 that was it. <laughs> yeah, meaning that the whole premise writes, of course, is you know uh, stable storage. Meaning if you write to memory. It's really fast, but if the power fails, you know, in that moment, what do you do? And uh, you know, even, even with the flash writes today, which are incredibly much faster than uh, than um, uh, hard disk, you know, one can see that if the flash was ten times faster writing, it would be significantly better. So this, I think, there's additional performance improvements that can be made in the existing uh, interface layer architecture on the device side, which of course then transfer into the rest of the stack that we'll hopefully see in the next few years. It's just when you get down to say 10 microsecond flash performance, then suddenly the I/O controller, you know, looks really magnified of how much of an impact it makes. At the sort of multi hundred microsecond level today, it's not quite as bad. It's it's bad as well, but not as visible as when the. Uh, the so the critical thing is the flash, the HCA, the flash memory controller, and the flash itself in terms of just boosting that chain. But if we could eliminate most of these things and go straight to a memory memory channel models, it, you know, on the hardware side, yes, we, we got rid of things. But on the software side, we have to then map the application as new hierarchy. OK, uh, question in the back. That's a very good topic, and I, I didn't have enough time to add this to my presentation. But clearly, um, any network is, relatively speaking, slow when you're talking tens of microseconds of device performance. So the fact that you know people have built beautiful fiber channel, SAN, whatever networks um, that do very useful things today uh, by itself does not make the flash go faster. If you know what I mean. In fact, it's obvious that existing fiber channel SAN technologies are major bottleneck to achieving you know, full, the full performance potential of Flash. So I'm not saying it's not going to be used with fiber channel sense, but you know, we will need a lot faster <laughs> fiber channel data rates, uh, TankGBD Ethernet, FCV, whatever comes next, InfiniBand, to even get close, to, to not make the network the bottleneck, right? So as when you get to, I mean, again, a conventional storage, storage system you know, is in the 10,000s of IO ops. You're talking now potentially million of IO ops, and uh, there's a factor of 100 in here somewhere that's not transparent to existing uh, networks, whatever the technology is. Now, uh, many of these uh, network technologies, of course, have their own roadmaps. You know, fiber channel wants to go from 8 to 16 to 32, uh, 10 gig is going from 10 to 40 to 100. Um, InfiniBand is already at 40, going to uh, 80 to whatever. Uh, so of all things, I actually would observe InfiniBand today as an off-the-shelf available item has the highest speed. Uh, hasn't seen a lot of deployment yet in, in storage applications, but if somebody really wanted to build the fastest uh, storage system today, this very moment, you know, InfiniBand may not be a bad place to look at um, or, or to start. On the other hand, it's not the standard thing, so it's less compatible with what people have. But what is true is that 
you know, the network is in the way. And when you get down to 10 microsecond kind of events, uh, it's not quite as bad on, on Wall Street where every microsecond counts, you know, but it's getting, getting pretty close to that. Uh, so we are actually a big fan of um, just using uh, direct storage attach for, in particular for the flash portion, where instead of assuming there's going to be this big SAN network, is to rely on the Intel roadmap of fast and faster controllers and just scale up the storage system with the controller to the point that the network doesn't look the same as it did before because you don't have the smaller, uh, you know, slower controllers that exist today. So I think it's sort of a race between just improving the, the DAS side of the world, meaning direct attach and memory channels and whatever, versus how to turn that thing back into a high speed network. So, I, so it's a, it's a, there's no easy answer to this because you know, it's such a big gap between the potential flash performance and the speed of, of today's storage networks. Yes, please. I, uh, I didn't quite write this bullet here really, but what I really meant on this no-brainer was uh, for the boot disk. So every server typically has a local boot disk, right? And you don't need a terabyte, uh, whatever it is for booting. You need 36, 72, whatever gigabytes is, is a lot. And you typically have two boot disks in case one fails. So replacing that boot disk, I'm talking about you know what's on the server blade or the server, the one new server, with Flash is a no-brainer because it's actually arguably cost effective today to do that. Maybe not this moment, but certainly next year. So I think that's that's what I meant by no brain is this boot thing. Now if you have terabytes of local storage because your application needs to store local data, that's harder because then you're back to three and a half inch, you know, terabyte SATA disks, which are much more cost effective than than flash. So it's really this this comment here I should qualify was relative to boot disks. But going back to the lifecycle question, you know the the truth about hard disks is that they do break and you know, we can argue what the failure rates are, but uh, it has been reported, at least in, you know, from companies that used, you know, very large number of disk drives, that the failure rates they see is in the range of three to five percent per year. You know, it's just sort of averaged out over the life cycle. So after, you know, five years, I mean, there's two problems here, right? One is you have to d design around this, meaning there's RAID and other mechanisms to recover. But uh, after five years, you know, a, the disk reliability is not exactly going up, and uh, one could argue that chances are half of your disk install base may have failed anyway. So let's just say for sake of argument that the conventional hard disk is kind of, you know, due for retirement in five years. Flash, single level flash, enterprise class flash will have the same attribute, meaning the projected life cycles with continuous operations, which not all applications do, by the way, but assuming 24 by 7 continuous writes, it will last five years. And that's a long time because, again, in five years from now, that flash will cost one hundredth or whatever, not one hundredth, one fifth of what one tenths what it costs today, and you know you just upgrade or replace it with a next generation flash device. So I think you know planning for upgrading the flash over time is a good thing to do, but uh, you will not worry about that flash going bad after five years. And it's a gradual process. And if it's just thousands and thousands of sectors on the device, you know one sector fails at a time, you lose one per mil. So it's it's not like it it doesn't have a mechanical failure mode like a disk. It's much less. Uh, what's the right way? I mean, you can use a fail in place model for Flash that you could not use with disk, for example. Yes? Yeah, the question was, uh, did we look at uh, other failure modes with Flash? And the truth is, we're still learning about this. In other words, they have to, flash have the most bizarre failing modes. So you know, suddenly something shifts and the whole row goes bad. Or I mean, it's it's not like a hard disk where you know one one track is a bit there. So the uh, challenge there is that the local controller, you know, that FMC controller, that has to that does the first level of of error correction, um, has to have the right algorithms to recover, you know, from these various uh, failure modes. 
And, and again, this is ongoing improvements at that controller level. And I should also add that, of course, you would use RAID regardless because the controller itself can fail, right? So assuming the, the disk, uh, the SSD is a controller plus so many flash chips, you know, if a single flash device fails, that's okay, you can recover from that. But if the controller fails, the whole thing is down, right? So now, again, the FTBF, MTBF or the fit rate of these controller chips is much better than a conventional hard disk, but it's not zero. And uh, as a result, you know, there's going to be new levels of uh, errors in flash that, you know, people just come to grips with what this means and how to recover better from that. But uh, suffice to say that at the highest level, meaning at the, if you substitute hard disk with SSD today, you're relying on these devices to put, do the right thing so that you don't see it. So that's at least the promise of inserting SSD into this existing hierarchy that, you know, we don't have to change anything else to make it more aware of, of those failure modes. But yes, there's bizarre failure modes. For which performance? Okay, yeah, so you're talking just the, the pure data transfer rate and that uh, that's not uh, that's much more similar than different. So, uh, state of the art, um, uh, you know, very high bit density uh, disk can do, let's just say, at least a hundred, if not more than a hundred megabytes per second continuous transfers. Right? Uh, flash disk at a at a device level, you know, the the original flash uh, devices, which were designed for cameras and, and USB sticks, they're running at 33 megahertz, eight bits wide. So, with even with four channels of those devices. Um, it's not faster than a, what you get, the bits you're getting of a hard disk. So at, at that level, it's sort of more or less parity. But I should add that there was no particular reason that the flash had to be running that slow. So as people know, the only reason have, may have been power consumption or battery lifetime in portable devices. So in an enterprise context, you know, people are looking at much, much higher data rates coming off the flash device, like I've seen a roadmap that goes from 133 megahertz to 266 and beyond that would improve that data transfer rate by, you know, 5 to 10x. But those haven't shipped yet and the controllers are not ready either. But you will see improvements in actual data transfer rates going forward. But as of today, you know, this moment in time, it's more or less the same. Last question, I'm being told. <laughs> Last question right here. So, um, so I'll try to do this in less than one minute because I think we're running out of time here. Um, clearly, the, the reason there's a file system is largely to separate the failure modes, what can happen you know, below from what the application sees. So integrating Flash into the operating system would require at least as much some layer you know, that deals with all the problems from below so that it's abstracted away, right? Otherwise, every application is, would have to deal with these things. And uh, this more or less sounds to me like it's a file system. Now, there's, you know, we can get into the another hour-long discussion of what why file systems are the way they are in the long history of this and how hard it is to change. But suffice to say, it's really hard to do new file systems. I mean, CFS, for example, has been in development since the early 2000s, and you know, it's just chipping stably now for a few years. Um, so it is it, it requires this kind of approach that's tightly coupled with the operating system to isolate the file fail modes from the application. And again, I'm not saying it has to be the file system API. It is some abstraction that you know is makes the world easier for the application writers on top uh, and maybe it can be made made look like a stable memory array right but that's local or remote that that seems highly desirable to me personally by the way but that you know api today doesn't quite exist but it's a simpler api so from that perspective maybe it doesn't take that long for applications to take advantage of it so i'll leave it at that thank you very much uh, for your attention